So um, we're going to try this video here and then we're going to get going right after it. Sometimes things that seem like a gift turn out to be something else entirely. Some might say sulfide mining brings jobs and an economic boost. But let's look at what history and science can teach us. Sulfide mining is the process of removing ores such as gold, copper, zinc, nickel, and silver from beneath the ground. In the mining process, deep pits are dug. They often need to be dewatered, which impacts surface waters, private wells, and aquatic critters. Cyanide, sulfuric acid, and heavy metals are all associated with the mining process, making it extremely toxic to humans and wildlife. In fact, a report from the US EPA shows that metal mining is America's most toxic industry, accounting for a whopping 37% of all toxics reported. Then the pollution starts. And keep in mind, there has yet to be a sulfide mine that has not polluted. Toxins leach from the mining waste and head for our drinking water and theirs. So how about the gift of jobs and boost to the local economy? Of course, everyone wants that. But in the case of sulfide mining, it's a real bait and switch. Mining communities across the U.S. are noted for high levels of unemployment, high poverty rates, and stagnant or declining populations. On top of that, mining in the U.S. is estimated to pollute up to 27 billion gallons of fresh water per year, forever. Someone has to pay to treat this water, and it won't be the mining companies. Taxpayers will face an estimated 57 to 67 billion dollars per year, a debt our children and grandchildren will pay just to have clean water. So if someone tries to present sulfide mining as a gift to your state or community, tell them to hit the road. It's never been done safely and without polluting drinking water, killing wildlife, and leaving locals to pay for the mess. While mining companies get rich and ride off into the sunset. So that, uh, that video, as you can see, was done by um, Wisconsin River Alliance, who's, uh, they just celebrated um, putting in uh, the fish ladders on the Menominee River uh, to allow the sturgeon to, to get up further up river. I think it allows them another like 20 miles up river. Uh, they just, <clears throat> they just uh, put those um, ladders in, I think it's two years now uh, that they've been in, in operation. They've had some uh, success with, with sturgeon moving back and forth. We went and toured that uh, mine, or, I mean the dam, where, well we did tour the mine too, but the, the dam well, where the first fish ladder is. And we actually, when we were there, we seen uh, the sturgeon come into the elevator and it's a pretty amazing uh, feat what they've done there. And the reason why they've done that is, is because of uh, one thing I found out by doing these talks is that 80% uh, of the breeding stock of Lake Michigan um, sturgeon only use the Menominee River. They're kind of like salmon in a sense, but they don't die when they spawn. They, they make it back down to the lake. Um, so that's another real big threat of why uh, this, this project, the Aquila and Back 40 Mine Project, is, is uh, um, extremely dangerous. So the, the uh, sturgeon, like I said, are, are now, at first they were blocked by the dams. They only had, I think it was like five miles of river, and it wasn't enough for the yearlings to get back to the to the uh, lake by all the predators. So that's why they put in these sturgeon ladders, and they're successful. So we're pretty excited about it. We're happy about it. I was when we were there to see those sturgeon come into the elevator on a non-spawning time of, time of the year. It was pretty amazing to see those uh, ancient fish. Um, in our language, we call those fish nimal, and it, uh, that word uh, references how prehistoric those fish are, we recognize that they were one of the original ones, and that's what that word kind of means. Um, in the prayer that I had spoken earlier, I had uh, talked about how, um, you know, when we come into a new area, we usually introduce ourselves. Um, they say, and it's not like this is new to us, we've been here for 1,000 plus years as Menominee's, but um, sometimes it's new people and it's other things, but we introduce who we are, and I said my name is Anakut. Um, it means a uh, good-looking guy, handsome guy, sometimes I've heard. <laughs> I don't know why everybody's laughing, that's weird. <laughs> um, actually, it means uh, cloudy skies. Uh, but my English name is Guy Ryder. Um, 
I uh, also, the way we're kind of uh, taught is we, we introduce our clan, and uh, mine is Wapashi and Nito, Nito Tamok, so that's what I said, is the Martin clan is my clan. Um, part of that um, responsibility as a Martin clan is we're the thinkers of the, of the community, we're also the warriors of the community, and not warrior in a sense of, you know, puffing your chest up kind of a warrior, but more of a one that protects the community. So uh, one of the things um, as our responsibility as, as Martin folks is, is getting out and doing these types of things and, and raising awareness about these um, potential uh, dangerous um, mines that, that, they, that they're potentially going to put on. This one um, is on the Menominee River, or it's, it's potentially going to be on the Menominee River. It's, it's been, uh, I think, about like 13 years been in the works. I think we're going on 14 years. So it's been around for a while. Um, Aquila Resources. Uh, any Aquila folks here today? No? Man, they usually are. Um, it's all right if you are. Hopefully we can kind of get you to understand a little bit more and, and the reason why this project is so bad. So um, this is thing, like I said, has been about 13, 14 years in the making. Uh, they never have submitted a permit at all. Um, they had a, a, a company by the name of Hud Bay. Um, Hud Bay is out of Canada, as is Aquila. Resources is out of Can uh, Canada. Any Canadians here? They're lucky. I'm going to talk after this. It always seems to be Canadians. I don't know. You get that whole stereotypical, uh, they're just nice and hello and all that thing. It doesn't seem that way all the time. Um, so. <clears throat> When Hunt Bay was, was with Aquila, um, they started this project, they dug a lot of holes and drilled a lot of holes to look at certain aspects of this mine um, and where the ore body is. So they, they never submitted an a actual permit though, they were just talking about it. And they spent I think somewhere of like $70 million trying to figure out, or that's the total they say they've, been, they've uh, spent so far. <clears throat> but um, I think it was like in, uh, 2009, uh, Hut Bay got into some trouble down in uh, Guatemala. They were uh, they were running an operation down there. Some of their uh, their employees were convicted or were charged with uh, some pretty serious uh, crimes, um, human rights violations, murders, rapes, tortures. They actually were sued in Canadian court by the Guatemalans, and they actually lost that case. When that news kind of hit the hit the wire, um, Hud Bay pulled out of the project. And they owned, at that time, 51% of the, the stock in, in this potential uh, back 40 mine. So when that happened, the, the, it just went dormant for like three years. Um, and then all of a sudden there started to be a little bit of talk about it and, and uh, things were happening, things were going on. Um, but there was nothing, there was no money, they're still kind of struggling um, to pay their bills, but in 2000, uh, yeah, December of 2015, out of the blue, we got, I think uh, it was like 15 days notice that they were going to submit a, a permit. They ended up submitting that permit. Um, they need four permits to actually get their mining permit. They have three of the four right now. The fourth one is pending. It's their hardest permit to get. It's called the wetlands permit. Um, basically, they got to like designate whatever wetlands they take out or if they're able to, they got to give something in, in return for that uh, wetlands, and there's a whole bunch of things that they got to do. Uh, everybody that was a part of this uh, in the beginning, not only the tribe, but River Alliance, and, and there's many other organizations that are involved, Earthworks, um, knew that this one would be their, their toughest fight. The wetlands would be the hardest, because that's where we, we get them the most. So as of right now, they've submitted that wetlands permit twice to the state of Michigan, the Michigan DEQ. And uh, twice it's got kicked back to them because they uh, had things missing or, or they, were, they said there was no wetlands, there was a bunch of wetlands kind of a thing. So they're in the process right now of, of they just got rescinded again, so they're working on it. We were expecting that they were going to um, resubmit that wetlands permit on Monday. Um, they've yet to do that as of today. So we're expecting you know, any time that they'll do that. So as of right now, it's, there's really no permit in place. Uh, there are no wet, wet wetlands, wetlands permit. But in the meantime, uh, the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin is suing the federal government and they're also suing the state of Michigan. Um, they have a contested case here over the mining permit right now. Um, it's ongoing litigation. Um, 
And then the, the tribe is also um, going to be suing the government because uh, what we're saying is that they're failing to, to uphold their trust responsibilities to the tribe. The thing about the state of Michigan is that um, the state of Michigan and, and New Jersey are the only two states in the union that have the federal authority to issue permits. So basically, they're the ones that do all the deciding the state does, and the, the federal government is just kind of like a add-on agency. Although they do have the power to pull the permit and pull that, that uh, designation to them if they want, um, but they haven't yet. Uh, so we're kind of hoping that they will. Um, one of the other things, too, that we're working on is, is uh, understanding the jurisdiction of the river itself and who there's never been a, like, determining, nobody's ever put down in paper and said, you know, the state of Michigan is the, is the agency, or nobody's ever said Wisconsin is the agency. Nobody said anything really concrete enough to, to know who, whose uh, jurisdiction the river is in. Um, and one of those things about that river is, is that, you know, it's all fine and dandy on the Michigan side because the company says it's got X amount of dollars for anything that goes bad, they'll repair it, they'll fix it even though you, you can't uh, repair or fix acid minus drainage, it's a forever thing. Um, but on the Wisconsin side, on the Wisconsin side of the river, there's absolutely no recourse for those residents that live on the Wisconsin side of the river. Uh, they don't have any kind of protections at all. So if this project potentially goes in um, and starts polluting that water, which it will, because every sulfide mine that's ever been put in anywhere in the country and in the world has polluted its environment. There isn't one that's not environmentally safe. Um, so the people out of Wisconsin don't have that voice. We've done a lot of things um, at the state capitol and tried to talk sense into some folks, but I'll tell you one thing I, I found out is common sense isn't so common. Um, it's hard to change people's minds who are being paid not to. <coughs> um, so we, we've We've done a lot of things, and I'm sure some of you are already familiar with the um, Prove It First law that just got passed. Yeah, shake hands, hands. Anybody know what that is? A few of you? Well, this is one that they just kind of slipped behind without anybody really paying attention, although we were. We kind of raised the fuss. The Prove It uh, First law, and this is kind of off the back 40, we'll get back to it. But, uh, the Prove It First law here in Wisconsin was put in, um, I think, 20 years ago during the Crandon Mine fight. Some of you older folks will kind of remember that when Crandon Mine was going. Basically what the Prove It First Law said, it's called the Mining Moratorium. What it said was that uh, if you haven't, you, if you can't demonstrate somewhere in uh, North America or in Canada where a company's ran, ran a, a mine for 20 years, and for, or for at least 10 years, and then 10 years they can show where they haven't polluted the environment uh, that they can go for a permit here in Wisconsin. And uh, there wasn't one company that was able to do that because mines pollute, obviously. So it's basically a mining moratorium law. Uh, just, just every proponent of the mines, though, they'll say that how fantastic they are, how the technology is so sound and you know, we have nothing to worry about. Not one of them could prove that when that law was on the books. That just got rescinded last month by uh, Mr. Tom Tiffany and a, a lot of other uh, um, Republicans that are in the state and the House. So, Wisconsin's open for business. Um, Aquila Resources, uh, Tom Tiffany is our district representative uh, in our district, District 12, uh, the Menominee Indian Reservation. He's the one that championed this, um, this effort to repeal the mining moratorium or the Proven First Law. Uh, when he was consulting the, his consultants, he consulted with Aquila Resources, the Canadian company. They helped draft up the laws and the words for the bill, and he never once uh, thought to talk to the Menominee Nation that's in his district. He never asked us about anything, um, which we kind of took as a slap in the face. So, with his, uh, with Aquila's backing, um, they went forward with the, the mining moratorium one, like I said, at the they were able to, able to get it repealed. So uh, we no, no longer have those protections that we had at one time. Um, one of the things too is, is Aquila owns a couple um, deposits in Reef and Bend, Taylor County, and uh, Marathon County right now. 
And uh, the, if you were to see where Aquila Resources is, it's like in that particular stretch of Wisconsin and Michigan, that's where all the ore body is now. And um, you better believe that when, when they get done with the back 40, if they get done with the back 40, if it gets going, that they're going to be over here and other companies are going to be in here. So this is a, a, something I think that we all need to be paying attention to uh, to make sure that we're, we're doing everything we can to stay informed, to protect our, our rivers and our, and our lakes. Um, you know, some of the things that I always hear all the time is that, well, jobs, right? You always hear that jobs, this, jobs, that. Nobody ever thinks to think about that, that river. You know, how, how much does that river do for us every day and the people that live around it? Um, the, the Menominee River is, is one of the, is a world-class uh, uh, smallmouth bass um, river. Uh, it was designated uh, one of the ten most dangerous, or uh, what is it? Help me. Yeah, endangered river, top ten. It made the top ten list in the whole country uh, because of this project, the Aquila Mine uh, Back 40 project. The thing about this one is, is that it's very close to the Menominee River. The actual pit itself is uh, 150 feet short of the Menominee River. Um, that's about half a football field. Uh, this, this pit that they're going to be digging out of is uh, 750 feet deep, which is uh, about two and a half Statue of Liberty standing on top, on top of itself. The whole site itself is about 850 acres. I mean, it's a monster of a site. Um, when this project, like I said, kind of first started to get going, when they did these things, they, they got to do all kinds of things, but one of the things they did uh, they say they did was an uh, archaeological survey um, where this potential project is is in Menominee County on the Menominee River. Uh, there's tons of archaeology up and down that river. Um, as they started this survey, they never thought to think. I never thought to think. I think the thought. I don't know, you guys know what I'm saying. Uh -huh. There's a Menominee Indian Reservation, 42 miles away. They never thought, well, maybe these people might have something to say. Even though the river's named Menominee and the county that they're in is named Menominee. They never consulted us. So basically what they went through and said, well, you know what, Menominee Indians, this is what's important to you. This is useless. This is sacred to you. This you don't need, kind of a thing. So that's the way that they determined what was important on their standards. And they never even consulted us. Um, in this particular project area, there's uh, three known burial mound groups. Uh, one is, is, is called the Backland Mound Group, another one is called the White Rapids Mound Group. Um, these are 1,200 year old mounds and garden beds associated with it, village sites. In 1956, Dr. Alan Spaulding from the University of Michigan excavated uh, one of the mounds in the Backland Mound Group. Uh, I was in the White Rapids Mound Group, sorry. And uh, he had taken out of there what he thought at the time was 22 bodies, but uh, come later with better uh, um, tools and techniques, we found out that it was more like 20. Back in February this year, we put in a NAGPRA claim, which basically says that this is, these are our relatives and we want them home. Uh, we did that to the state and to the University of Michigan. We actually won that claim and our elders came back to us on the reservation and we just buried them um, like two weeks ago. So it was a real important, important event for us to have those come home. Um, I, th I guess the, uh, the irony in it for me is, is that, you know, we as Menominee people that have been here for 10,000 plus years, we're the longest living inhabitants of the state of Wisconsin and Michigan. Uh, we're older than both of these states. We have to prove to a, a, a new relative um, community that's here now, that just got here a couple hundreds of years ago, we have to prove to them that these are our ancestors. You know, it, it, to me, it, it was upsetting in that sense that we had to do that. Um, <clears throat> but that's the way it goes with us indigenous people. You know, it seems that we're unseen and unheard and, and nobody cares how we, we feel. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to say is that, you know, this particular area where, where uh, this potential project is going to be is where our creation story began as Menominee people. It started at the mouth of that river and that first Menominee came out of the earth there um, and walked up that river and it started our tribe. It's kind of like in a sense, I guess, if you could find where Adam and Eve's 
uh, garden was, if you could find where that was, and then you said, you know what, we're going to put a sulfide mine right on it. You know, Christians would go crazy. This whole world would go up and over, over that. But for some reason, for us, it's okay. And I'm telling you, it's not okay. I'm telling you, we're not going to take it anymore. Because one of the things that we can't be, uh, can't happen to us anymore is we can't be invisible. We need to be seen. You know, we're the natural first inhabitants of this land. This is our land, where we come from. This is who we are. Our language belongs here. Our culture belongs here. You can hear it in our words when we talk. You can hear the melodic uh, sound of our language. It belongs on this earth. It belongs here, in this land. And we could tell you guys all those things about that river. We could tell you all the oral histories about it, all the secrets of it. Those were given to us thousands of years ago by the Creator. And, um, you know, one of the things I, I always stress is that we as uh, people that live here in, in Wisconsin nowadays, you know, we live side by side for how many years? You know? And do we know each other? How many of you that are non-natives know how many tribes are in Wisconsin? How many? Thirteen. What's that? Thirteen. Thirteen. Did any of you guys know that? Are you guys lifelong residents of Wisconsin? No? Some of you are, some of you aren't. Some of you are. We should know that. We live side by side for 500 some years. We should know each other. We should start listening to each other, talking to each other. You know, we as indigenous people, we went through climate change already. We've survived through the Ice Age here on this land. In that particular area uh, where the back 40 mine is, there's prehistoric garden beds two miles long. And uh, they've been carbon dated 1,200 years, year old um, garden beds. And, and one of the things about that is, is those particular garden beds are the only ones that are left in, in the state of Michigan. And uh, that's the highest, I don't know if it's longitude, latitude, or whatever it is, it's the highest you can go for corn agriculture um, anywhere in the country. And uh, these are the last ones, and they're very important. We've been doing a lot of studying at home on the reservation of, of our garden beds and surrounding areas, even around here, um, trying to figure out how did our ancestors do it. Because they did it without insecticides, they did it without pesticides, they did it without animals. They did it when the climate was changing very rapidly from day to day. So those are, those are I think, you think about that, pretty important things we want to know, especially at this day and age in 2017. Um, so I, I, I know you guys come here to, to uh, hear about this Back 40 project and, and learn about sulfide mining, but I wanted to tell you, as handsome I, as I am, I'm not a scientist. I am handsome, but I'm not a scientist. <laughs> a couple laughs, I'll take it. Um, so one of the things that I've always done and done from the beginning is, is go on to uh, Grandfather Google. Figure out what, <laughs> what sulfide mining does to your environment. What, it's, what it does to the, to, the, to the land and what it does to the water. Um, I, I don't want to sit here and talk about it and, and go on and on about the effects of it. Go read about it. Figure it out. It, it's devastating. It creates um, uh, dead zones. You know, everywhere it goes, sulfide mine, mining. And, and the thing about sulfide mine is, is this particular project is where they, what they have to do is 90% of the rock that they get out of that pit is going to be waste rock, which is just um, rock that's within sulfide uh, chemicals and when, it, when you add air and water to it, it creates acid minus drainage, which never goes away. And 90% of the rock they're going to get out of there, that's where, what it's going to be, and they're going to be storing that. Right next to the river, 150 feet short of the river, half a football field. And they're still telling me that it's not going to pollute. Don't worry about it. We've got all the environmental regulations. As you know, Michigan is, is on top of their environmental regulations. We don't have to worry about it. Right? Yeah? Where's Aquila? Aquila, you here? No. <laughs> but uh, so I've kind of touched a little bit on, on other things. And I do want to leave some time for my, my nephews and nieces here that are here from the reservation. And um, one of the things I, I always talk about when I'm, when I'm around at other places, when I go to, and we've been crisscrossing the state doing these talks. Uh, Dr. Al Geddes is usually with us. There's a whole bunch of people 
uh, scientists that, that do come with us and uh, geologists and things. Um, they're, uh, one of the things that they, they always talk about is, is, is um, you know, this, this fight, this back 40 fight, you know, is being led by us indigenous people because it's our, our natural homeland, it's where we're from. And I'm always, uh, when I'm crisscrossing the state, it seems like sometimes when I'm in these talks, it's a lot of white hair sitting around these tables listening. And it's not a lot of our, a lot of our young people. And they're the ones that are going to be left with this. They're not going to be, have the luxury of growing old and, and going fishing on the Menominee River and spending time memorial out there with their grandkids. Unfortunately for them, they're going to have to fight and they're going to have to do everything they can um, to have a clean, clean water and uh, fresh water and, and a clean environment. One of the other things too I wanted to quickly mention is that, you know, as indigenous people, one of our our responsibilities is that we, when I talked to you earlier about my clan and, and who I am, um, they always say that we should be those ones to speak up for those ones that don't have a voice. For all those uh, animals up there along that river, for all those birds up there that lived up here for thousands of years and now all of a sudden they're going to be displaced. For all those fish that are in that water, they're all going to be, uh, they're all under attack. And somebody needs to speak for them. They can't obviously write a comments and they can't come to the public hearings and, and do all those things. Um, speaking of, of public hearings, we're looking at like sometime in the end of January as we'll, they'll hold their next public hearing. All these things with the state of Michigan, they kind of go by a time sequence. So as soon as that permit is, is submitted, it goes to like a two week um, administratively complete. So the Michigan DEQ makes sure that they have everything complete. Once they do that, like the clock starts ticking. Then they have uh, 90 days to put on a public comment period and a, um, a public hearing, which they'll have at the um, Stevenson High School in Michigan. It's right on the river. It's only, I'd say, about an hour and 15 minutes from here. It's not too far. Um, so they'll have that, and then in between those 90 days, they got a decision to make. Either they grant it or they don't. Um, now, this thing is never never an easy thing where it's just going to be like the next day they're going to get out there and, and get on the, uh, the land and start digging it up. Like I said, there's a contested case hearing right now that they'll have to deal with and there's many other challenges that will come to this permit, I'm sure, as, as the further we get. So we're not under uh, a crunch time per se, but we are. Because once, it, once the state makes an action like that, um, it's hard, it's very, very hard to make them unmake that action. Once they grant that permit, it's almost impossible to make them ungrant it. Although if you'd ask Tom Tiffany and the Republicans down there, they did it in 30 days. They were able to repeal that mining moratorium law. If we as a, as a grassroots organization, or me as an individual, if I ever wanted to repeal that law, it would have took me years to do it. But they do it just like that. And, and you know, I've learned a lot in this fight, you know, going down to the state and watching how our politics are and, and uh, seeing how things are happening. And uh, sometimes it, it bothers me so very much when I think about our youth here, when I think about our young ones, what's going to be left for them. You know, that we can't sit at a table, you know, and talk to one another, that we can't find common ground. You know, like this is, we all have to live here, we all have to drink water here, you know. And uh, why are we putting uh, profits over people? It doesn't make sense to me. One of the things that I've always told people at every talk that I've been to, and what I'm going to say today, I say to you guys too, is that if it comes down to me standing in front of those machines, that's what I'm going to do. I hope I don't have to do that, but I'm going to do it. Because that's how much it means to me. Our, our elders that are in that ground, that they gave up so much for us to survive. Now, some of you may or may not know the history of us indigenous people and us, us Menominees, but you know, we went through a lot. We went through genocide. We went through forced relocation. We went through boarding school eras. We went through many, many things as a people. We were terminated as a tribe back in the uh, 60s. Then we were restored in the 70s by a grassroots effort to get us restored. And there's a lot of, a lot of things I could go on and on about all the things that have happened to us as indigenous people, as Menominee people. But we made it. We're survivors. We're here. We're not going anywhere. We're always going to be here. This is where we're from, like I said. And, and we will always be here on this land. 
because we have a relationship with the land. We take care of it, it takes care of us. It's the way it's always been. And my, my young relatives here, they know that. They're learning, they're, they're already learning those things. They're knowing about this tobacco. Why does that matter? To offer that net and all before we talk, to let those ones know that we care. Let them know we're here. We believe. We know what our ancestors taught us. How were we able to, as indigenous people, endure all those hardships? How were we able to go through all those things and still come out the other side somewhat intact, speaking our language, practicing our culture? How were we able to do those things? One of the ways that we did it is through our language, it's through our culture. Our language is under attack, as is our culture. And um, colonialism is, is, is a heck of a thing. It's been doing a lot of damage to our communities. But we're rebounding and we're building it back. We're waking up, as our young people say, stay woke, right? You're woke, right? How many of you know that term? Where are you young folks at? You guys woke? Raise your hand if you're woke. Are you sleeping? What? <laughs> All right. See that? They know. They know what's up. My relatives here, they know. It's time for you white-haired fellers to get woke and to wake up. Because we're in this together. And uh, when I was out in Stevens Point talking at a, at a function out there, there was a young girl that was crying when I was talking to her. She was all tears, and I didn't want to say, hey, what are you crying for? As I was talking to all these people, but I, was, I, I noticed it. After we were done, she said, after we were done, she came up to me and she said, you know, she says, I, I couldn't contain myself. She said, I was thinking about all the things that my people have done to your people, she said, through, your, through our histories. She said, but yet here you are, still caring enough about us to help us, to protect us, to protect my generations growing up. To protect my kids. You know, I never thought of it that way. But I thought, yeah, that, that's the way we are as indigenous people. We care about all of us. We understand that this is our mother earth and this is all we have as a people. And uh, if you look around, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look around and see there's things that are happening. Climate change is real. Um, I know I kind of covered a lot and talked about a lot, but I want to pass this mic to my nieces or nephews that want to come up here. And, well, we can take some questions and then, and then we'll have them come up. Question, you said that the weapons uh, permit has been rejected twice. Do you know what the basis for the rejection? And is that something that you think Aquila will be or will not be able to overcome in the final analysis? Um, the first time it was rejected, there was 16 pages full of things of why it was rejected. Um, this time it was like maybe two. Um, so they're slowly getting it. It's not things that they can't do. Some of the stuff is, is just logistical things that they need to do. Some of it is as like simple as just rewording things. Um, I don't think that, uh, that they won't be able to accomplish it. I think they'll eventually get to it. It's just some of the stuff, some of the things that are on there, they gotta like um, make sure they uh, determine like the, the habitat of some of the mussels that are in the, the lake and some, you know, it's not, it's nature, right? It's not like you can just go in there and say, hey, today, where are you guys? You know, <laughs> this is what we're gonna do. So some of that stuff is that, but uh, eventually I'm, I'm pretty sure they'll be able to, to get all of that. She said they were reading off old maps too, so that kind of made things difficult. Yeah. Uh, are you working with our, your friends over in Bad River about this, just south of there? We just went through this. Yeah. Um, well, is this thing on? No. Well, yeah, but I think the world was about involved in that too. Well, they're not will the same. A lot of the same players and financiers. So uh, this thing is dead. Um, but yes, we've been uh, globally, or at least uh, nationally, there's a lot of things that are happening right now um, to be aware of. There's a lot of things that our indigenous communities are, are fighting, but other communities too, like some of you may or may not know about the KXL pipeline, Keystone Pipeline. They're in talks right now, you know, number 45 there, you kind of gave the order to 
to get started on it. So there, there's strategies and there's things that people are meeting right now about that. How many of you have heard about Standing Rock? Right. I mean, that's still something that's being litigated and things like that. Um, do you have a question? Um, will you talk about how a lot of um, organizations and activists are turning to Native nations to lead the fight because you have more authority to make things happen? Well, I don't know about more authority, but we definitely have some, some angles that we can take that uh, normal folks can't. I and mean, that's easily recognizable if, if you're any kind of informed on, on the way that tribal uh, governments are dealt with with the state and treaty rights and all those things. Some of you may remember that whole, uh, uh, when I was young, the whole fishing, uh, Chippewa Treaty, fishing rights and things, and things got kind of contested there. But when you look at the Crandon mine, you can see how that kind of switched. That once we had <coughs> collected interests amongst each other, you know, we, we started working together. Um, I, I've heard many, many times before uh, a lot of our, our elders talk about how if you look at this country, it's starting to lose a sense of itself, they say. Start to not know, knowing. There's so much fear. Everybody's afraid. And there's a lot of conflict. A lot of people arguing with one another. Don't know anymore. Don't remember what it's, what it's like to be connected to our earth. And our indigenous people, we never lost that connection. We're very much connected to this earth. Uh, we know that this, how this earth was put together the way that we, we were taught. And uh, we know if you listen, it will talk to you. My grandmother, when I was young, she always said, if you ever feel bad, or if there's things that aren't going on in your life, she said, take some of your tobacco, go down to that river, talk to that river. Let it know what it is that you're looking for, and you'll get your answer. And I'm telling you, as a 38-year-old man, I've always gotten my answer. It's not ever all the time I liked it, but I've gotten it. And uh, one of the things that we did really early on is, is we started, uh, when we started to uh, uh, up, uh, oppose this potential project, we did a, a sacred water walk, where we walked from our reservation all the way to the mine site. It was 126 miles, one way. They told me it was all downhill, don't worry about it. And I'm telling you, it wasn't that. <laughs> there was a lot of hills, up and down. Um, we, did, we did that in three days. We walked out. Skip was with us. You know, my aunt here was with us. Some of our, my uh, relatives here were with us as we walked. All the way from the white hairs all the way down to the littlest ones walked that way. We didn't hold signs. It wasn't a protest. We did it because we understood that connection with our land and our water. We were letting our land and we were letting our water know. We hear and we're not gonna we're not gonna sit down and just let these things happen. We're letting our water know our intent. My grandmother, Josephine Mendamin, who's the, the Mother Earth water walker, she started these water walk movements. And I know they've done them here, around Lake Winnebago. Um, they say we do those things in prayer. Uh, for us, we are taught that the women have that responsibility of speaking up for the water, because they were given that responsibility by the, by the Creator when they hold that life within their belly. They hold that water inside. So that's their responsibility. Us men, we respect that and, and we, we stand with them in solidarity. And we walk with them and support them. And that's what we did. So our women carried a copper kettle all the way from our reservation all the way up to that mine site. And uh, as we were walking, um, I, I, I don't know anybody that's ever took a, like a long walk. You, you know right away how tired you get. So after about 30 seconds of walking, I was like, <laughs> No, uh, there's a little more than that. It's like maybe two minutes. <laughs> my, my grandmother seen me, and she said, Nephew, go, jump in. I want to talk to you. And then I thought, oh, man. Here it is. Sat down, and she says, you know, Nephew, she says, uh, I want you to think about what we're doing. She said, Jerry, as we're holding this water, she says, uh, I want you to think about all those ones that can't walk right now. She says, maybe they're sitting in a hospital. Maybe they're in their, their home, and they're handicapped, and they can't get up here and walk, but they want to, she said. She said, think about all those generations that are to come. Um, you're walking for them, she said. Think about all those little ones, she said, that are here now. You're walking for them. Think about all those ones um, that can't get up here, like those four-legged, those winged ones. She said, think about all those as you're walking. Think about your relatives that have came and gone. Think about them as you walk. 
for seven. And uh, after about a good five minute guilt trip, I was like, all right, all right. <laughs> I don't know. But I understood, I understood what she was saying. And uh, there was a phrase that we used as, as we walked. And uh, we, when we would exchange, the women would exchange the water from each other, we would say, we do this for the water. We do this for the water. And after three days of walking, um, this spiritual walk and trying to walk in, in a good way, in a good heart, that phrasing and, and that type of, uh, that sentence started to make more and more meaning to me. It started to become part of me, you know, that word, or the, that sentence, we do this for the water. Like I said before, we've been crisscrossing the state, I've been crisscrossing this country. We went to the United Nations last year and spoke about the back 40 mine. We've been out to Oakland, California, we've been down to Phoenix, Arizona, been all over this country letting people know that we're, we're fighting this thing and we need help. And I come down here today to ask you guys that. But we need your help. We can't do this alone. We need each one of us to get woke, get involved. Because our earth is, our earth needs us. We need to stand together. Our, our animals and our plants need us. And our future generations, your future generations, need you. And I can't say it's going to be easy, and, and I wouldn't, I know it's not, it's not easy. And I'm not talking to just <coughs> Democrats or, or, or uh, Republicans, I'm talking to human beings. It doesn't matter, those labels don't matter. What matters is that we stand together for the, the betterment of our earth and the betterment of our, our future generations. We do it in a good way and a good heart. Um, and I know my, my nieces and nephews here want to, I want to get up and say some, some things, and I'm, I'm always encouraging to find that voice. When I was young like that, it took a lot for me to get up and talk. But one of my, my grandfathers uh, always said, uh, is uh, you were given a gift by the Creator. All of us were. And one of, one of the gifts that we were given was our voice. And we should always use it. Don't ever silence it. Don't even let yourself silence it. And to speak for those ones that can't get here, like I said, my nephews and nieces, they know that. They know about, about the animals. They know about the, the birds and the plants and our, our, our ancestors that are in the ground. They're, they're the ones that are speaking for them now. And it's a heavy responsibility, but they understand. So any of you young folks want to come up here and let these guys know a little bit about what it means to be a young Menominee and defending our land and defending our, our water.
the next seven, seven generations. All right, sorry, I'm just really nervous because there's just a lot of people here. Take your time. And I've never really spoken. We're all our relatives here. Come yeah. here to support us. Don't worry. Let's shake right now. Um, but yeah. Um, and I've always listened to like my elders and everything, and they kind of taught me like use your voice and. Kind of what I believe in, and like even when it feels like no one's listening, you know, it feels like we've like reached defeat. That our hearts are always listening, and we would always have each other, and everything. And, you know, I feel like we have the power to stop killer resources from destroying our river. And, Can you speak up? Um, destroying our beautiful Miami River, our place of origin, the place where that first ancient bear stood up, that first Menominee man, the place where we began as Menominee people. We have the power to protect that. That's it. Thank you for listening. Fossil Mamani Wiak, Ne Wiswan, Adrian Tucker, Mamaje Tao Ne Wiswan, Osan Kanyuki, Anitsky Wakian, Ninawaya Mihikan. What I just said right now is. Hello everyone, my name is Adrienne Tucker, my spirit name is Golden Eagle Woman, and I live in Middle, Midway, Kishina. Oh. 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 Wow. Okay. And that river to me has a lot of meaning behind it. I went fishing there. Ever since I was a child, I went swimming there, even though sometimes I didn't. I was just a little baby, and I just, my dad, my mother, and my father would tell me I'd just take off my pamper and try and go run in there, even though I couldn't swim. <laughs> so, that always scared them. But I've loved that river ever since I was young. It has a lot of memories and meaning. As I got older, the meaning got bigger and bigger to me. It's where my people came from, it's where I came from. It's like my relation, where it all began. And we're talking about how we have a voice, in which I believe we do have a voice, but who will give us their ears to listen? And who will comprehend it in their minds to take action? That river, I was like, I rarely travel, because like ever since I was a kid, my travel was around the Menominee County. It's where my forest was. There was enough adventure in that forest itself for me as a child. That river, too, had a lot of adventure. I've learned a lot of things. There's a lot of legends behind it, and there's lessons behind it, too, within them stories. And so, knowing about this mine, it kind of, it kind of like makes. Hmm, how would I say this? It kind of feels like disrespect towards my, like, my heart and my Menominee self, since I am a Menominee woman and I was raised around that area for 17 years of my life, because I'm 17. Pretty soon 18, so it does hold a lot of memories, meaning, and it's where my heart will always stay. Even if I go travel, I know I'm always gonna come back to my land, and I know I'm always gonna be happy to see my river. I don't want my river to change, like, from this mine. I don't want it to look like mustard. It's, from what I've seen, a lot of the rivers that were impacted by sulfide mines usually end up looking like mustard, and I don't, I don't have enough burgers for all that mustard, so I don't think I would want that much. <laughs> so yeah, this. I hope that my voice will reach out, and all of our voices will reach out to many people, and I hope that they help us take action. As Menominee people, we would help others. 
And we hope that that's within other people surrounding us too. Thank you, that's all. Also, I want to be up um, and ask three single chants. My macho town name is one. In that no near. Next year, waking casita. In translation, hello everybody. My name is uh, La Chance. My Menominee name is Little Boy in Clearwater. Um, I am from Kashina. Um, I am from the Bear Clan. Um, one thing I want to share with you today is my Menominee name. Um, before I was born, my grandpa had a vision of my mother and my older brother being on the banks of a river. And um, my grandfather had a vision of a little boy, a third person, uh, with my mother. It was just a small child and he was playing in the creek. And a couple of years later, my, uh, my mother decided to have another child. And that's how I got my name, Little Boy in Clearwater. I was playing in the creek. And I always like to think that that were in the Menominee River in that vision. And sure enough, just recently I was told that and that's where that vision took place, on the Menominee River. And the fact that that river has a huge impact on who I am and what my name is, and where I come from, that river obviously means a lot to me. crazy to think that I just think about that because my mind was blown and I figured that out. And another thing is uh, my time is bare. Our role in the tribe is to are the speakers and uh, my friend is telling me that I'm really good with words but tonight I'm going to let you guys be the judge of that. <laughs> um, I was given the question, why is the youth important? For this movement. Um, I don't think it really should be much of a question or if it should be an obligation. Because when I heard about this, I didn't, I didn't sit around and ask questions. Um, I got up and kind of figured, figured out what I could have done in order to help and well, here I am. To me, it feels like a responsibility in order to protect my ancestors and our birthplace. Um, to our ancestors, we were valued. 500 years ago, we were valued. A thousand years ago, we were valued. There's a saying, and they used to say, today is a good day to die for my children to live to see tomorrow. I value my ancestors as much as they value mine. And uh, I think last spring, I was given the opportunity to go check out our burial mounds where my ancestors were buried, and it's a thing of beauty, how tall those mounds are, um, seeing the garden beds, walking on the same lines where my ancestors walked. It's, it's mind blowing. And uh, we saw a mound, and it was dividend, it was tampered with. Some people dug up the bodies, and they took them to a museum, that angered me. They desecrated my ancestors and I would, I would strongly dislike if someone dug up my grandpa. I personally think that our, our ancestors should be left alone. And because they valued me as much as I valued them. And through 500 years of pain, genocide, cultural, Climate change, boarding schools, we lost a huge chunk of our language and our culture. We lost a lot of things, a huge chunk of our land. Now we're losing our ancestors. And you can most likely hear the pain in my voice because well, it's a struggle that very few understand. And I hope that our words today will have you understand what we're going through. Uh, because of that, I'd like to 
thank you all for coming here today. Thank you for listening. That's all I have to say. Sorry, I should ask a small question there. Bolson Mani Wiak, Ne Wiswan Dalian, Wachi Tao Ne Wiswan Namonani. What I said. Hello, everybody. My name is Dalian, and my Menominee name, well, wasn't like given properly, but nickname I was given was Honest Man or Truth Man. And I just want to tell a small story about uh, me growing up and how now this is affecting me. When I'm uh, growing up, anyways, I went to school in Shana and I wasn't really introduced to my culture or language or anything because I was isolated somewhat. I didn't go to the res a lot. I lived in Shano, and obviously at Shano schools, they don't teach the language or the culture. So in middle school, I went to Menominee, and I did not have a single cultural bone in my body. I literally probably only knew Poso. That was about it. So telling everybody hello, and that was about it. So, Going through, at the time, I just, I really didn't know what to think. I mean, I heard that the language is dying and everything, but in my head, I just couldn't comprehend what was going on. I just seen it as like, okay, somebody over here could probably, they, they're speaking it, or they're speaking it, oh, they're teaching it. I just never thought of how, what's the word here? How endangered we were. Until finally, my junior year of high school started where I had to take a foreign language class. And I see Menominee language is open, so I decided I'll take it. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to like it or not. I got in it in the first two weeks of being in that class of Don teaching me. I fell in love with it. Everything with it. I just, I could not stop speaking it. I loved learning it. It was something that I just, I, I don't know how to explain. Just me sitting there learning these words and just being able to pick it up so quick and be able to teach other people these words, it was, it was amazing. So then continuing on with that, I just started getting more and more involved and I actually started paying attention to what was going on or, like, around us and I realized that like, we are in so much danger and we only have so many people fighting for us. And I find it sad how a lot, a lot of the people fighting for this are the elderly because who, who are you guys going to pass it to when you guys pass on? If there's not much youth or not much adults there to pick it up, What's going to happen to the rest of us? A lot of people I talk to about this, they say, it's not my fault the culture is dying. It hurts to hear that. Because we, I, I don't, I'm not trying to sound negative, I'm not trying to point fingers, but if you're not doing anything to help it, you, you can't just say it's not my fault. It, would, it wouldn't kill you to say, oh so, on and up. You know, hello, how are you doing to somebody? Instead of just, going, oh, hi, everybody knows English, not everybody knows Menominee. So talking about going, I, I was able, I was given the opportunity last year, along with Lachance and a lot of the students here, to go to the, um, our mountains and everything in Michigan. And it was, it was mesmerizing being there, considering that so many years ago, my people were there. I was standing right where they were standing. It, it feels so empowering, and it's something different. Like, obviously anybody can go anywhere and stand and say, oh, somebody was here 100 years ago, but does that mean anything? I mean, honestly, when, you're, when you have this indigenous connection, and you know that there was people working hard back in the day and doing things completely different from now, it just feels so weird, because you really look back on it and you think, what if I was like that now? Say like okay, um, like saying that the, they did all this to the people, like all these bad things to the people. We'll just do one more, and you'll probably be all right. 
But I just think that's wrong because it just means a lot that we have great bear came out here. Um, it just means a lot to our people for, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of going off the top of my head now, I want to say. But, uh, It's so wrong for him to do that, for people just to like, think that it's okay to, like, to uh, mess up the environment. Because right? it's the only one that we have. It's, there's no other like it. There's, there's, just, there's nothing here. There's nothing out there else just like ours. And we're, we should just be here to protect it and keep it how it is. And just keep it, keep it alive. Yeah, and I think that's all I'm going to say right now. Post my mom anyway. Oh my god, it's real. Uh Kame went in the SVC and Kame Wanuki Mumacha Tony this one. Um Nitor Tam Kane. Um hello everyone. My name is Kame Wamakini. My Indian name is uh Rain Woman. When I first thought, or when I first heard about this mine, it truly did break my heart. Um, just, I've never been, well I have been now, I recently went out to see the barrier mines, and, or barrier mounds, and seeing where my people were, it's, I think it's absolutely, beautiful up there. I saw the river and <laughs> it just broke my heart trying to like wrap my head around that that's gonna be that could be destroyed. That beautiful river could be destroyed. When I went up there I was sitting in a van and I was on the road and I was probably about eight feet away from where the mine was going to be held. When I saw that, that was a lot of land. I saw all of the dead trees. They must have been killed by chemicals. I saw there was absolutely no life there. And, and it's it's so, it's so awful to think about that, that all those trees were dead there. But there was just this one tree that was there, and it was small. It was a little pine tree. And I looked at it, and I kept looking at it. It, it was screaming, help me, I don't want to die. That truly did break my heart because what if that was an actual little child there? That child didn't get to grow up and see the beautiful river. That tree didn't get to grow up. It's, it might or it might not grow up and it won't see what it can actually do. It could be a home for squirrels. It could be a home for a raccoon. It could be a home. And it truly broke my heart seeing that. Just this little tree surrounded by a whole bunch of like dead ones. And it was awful. When I think about that hole, I think of like all the chemicals that might be put into it and Metaphorically speaking, I think of it as a drug that you're gonna be you're gonna be putting like heroin or cocaine or something inside of Mother Earth, which would be your body. And you're slowly killing yourself, you know? And it's just It's awful thinking of like that, but that's truly how I see it.
My ancestors fought for me to say these words out loud. And I'm not going to let that go to waste at all. My grandmothers and my grandfathers, they fought truly very hard. And I don't, I can't let that happen. I can't let this mine happen. And see all of their hard work just to be thrown away. Sure, this mine is going to be, it's going to be filling a lot of jobs for people. But is the money actually worth it? Is it really worth it? Is killing hundreds of trees, is it killing the earth, is it really worth it? Without those trees, you have no money. The paper comes from money. Thank you. Also, my own way, in the SEC, the line, in the NK, in the Yamakuki, Michigan, in the Total Time, in the Michigan, in the Sea Waking, the Sheena. Hello, everyone. My name is Deborah Lyons. Um, my Indian name is the Nubian woman. I'm from the Bear Clan, and I'm from Kashina, Wisconsin. Um, hello. Oh, and I'm the Miss Menominee, 2017-2018. That's what my sash and crown represents. Um, the self life mine is horrible. Um, <laughs> But um, I think as a youth that we should stand up for this and I hope that this never goes through because it's going to ruin who we are and Mother Earth. And if this does go through, it's going to ruin our hunting and gathering. And Where it's taking place, it's where we came from. It's who we are. And it's really going to affect our future generations a lot. And um, where this mine is, it's where pretty close to our ancestral mounds, and our ancestral mounds are native mounds. And um, so I just really hope this don't go through, and as a youth, um, well, we do this for the water, hope. Um, um, my name means wildflower by the moon river and it's really nice to see all you people here today and thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to mention just um, just to take a look at the people behind me, just to take a look at all of us and realize that this is just a small chunk of the people who live on our reservation. You've heard their words, you've heard their stories, you've heard their voices and understand that this is going to take a lot out of us. But let me just mention that um, with whatever happens, we will still have each other. We'll still have our language. We'll still have our people. We'll still have our love. Um, we're not gone yet. Our bodies don't really belong in museums. Our heads don't belong on display. We're not meant to be sold, like sold in, um, in shops as souvenirs for some place. We matter, we're still alive, we're standing right here. We're not the only tribe in Wisconsin or in this world. Just to think that our river made it on the top 10 endangered list in the world, that's saying something. Think of like how many rivers are like everywhere. This is ours. Um, I just, 
I really wish that all of the words could touch you or touch your hearts and then um, that you can really understand where we're coming from. You've seen our pain, you know where we're coming from and we need you guys as well. This isn't going to pass with just us, we've tried, we're still trying and um, it's not over yet. Um, I just want to say that much about all of our people, you know we're still um, We still have so much more to live for than just what we already have. There's so much more we can do and so much more we're, we are going to do for all of that. And um, I just, I really appreciate the people standing behind me and I hope you guys can too. And um, just thank you for being here. Keep it going, Laura. Sorry. <laughs> Good, we're good. I know it's not easy to get up and, and uh, use that voice. Um, one of the things I kind of wanted to mention too is, is uh, um, you know, my one of the teachings that we got, or I got when I was young, is said that um, you know everybody that comes into your life, they come into your life at a certain time to teach you something, to uh, to show you something about yourself, or either to help you grow. Um, there's no surprise to me that why you guys are in this room with us today. Each one of you is here, took the time out of your day to come here, to hear this. There's something pulling you here. There's a reason why you're hearing our voices. The water needs you. Mother Earth needs you. We need you. Your grandkids need you. Your great-great-grandkids need you. To stand together. Stand together and stand up for our water. Stand up for our land. Stand up for all those animals and plants. If you took that action to come here today, let's do another action. We're going to have a sign-up sheet over there. We're going to be doing some events coming up um, on the river and, and also around the river. Hopefully each one of you will put your email down. I don't know how many email or maybe a phone number. Um, so you can keep and stay with us and, and, and see what we're doing. There's a petition as you can see on there. Um, I'm just proud of our, our, our youth here. Finding that courage to come up here and speak in front of people, it's not easy. I know you all understand the significance of them being here. And I'm proud of them. I'm proud of each one of us. Standing up for your ancestors. Hearing and knowing that you are their prayers. You are coming. You are that flesh, that hope that they had. Is in each one of us and I'm proud of you. And Wailana, thank you guys for inviting us here today. Thanks for UW Fox Valley for having us come today and each one of you is being here and, and taking time out of your day to listen. And I see my aunt is making her way up here so I better pass this thing to her. I would just like to invite you all in helping us in a way that we could fight this, even though that um, prove it first law has is right sitting on the governor's table. We can still fight it in a sense that you go to the county boards, you go to your city boards, this appeal has already moved into Wisconsin. It's in Marathon County. It's in Taylor County. They're trying to get to mine that, those, those um, lakes and streams up there. What you can do is go to these and tell them you don't want them to purchase this land. You, if they can't buy it, they can't, they can't mine it. So we need your help to go to these counties and help spread that word. I mean, um, yeah, we, we are fighting for our burial grounds. We are fighting for the water. But we also need, this is our standing rock for everybody in Wisconsin. Yeah. This is not the end. We can still stop it from happening, even though they sign that bill and flip it over. We need to spread it out all over Wisconsin. That's what I'd just like to say. Thank you for coming. Where are you at with the lawsuit? Um, so um, it's in current litigation, so we're still, uh, the tribe and, and uh, the company in Michigan DEQ is still figuring things out on how it's going to go and what's going to go. Um, we're trying as a tribe to get all the permits into one so we can do one, or uh, do separate litigations, but they want to kind of combine it into one, but it's, it's harder when they combine it into one, so we're hoping to keep them separate. Um, so it's, it's ongoing. So right now we're on kind of like a 60-day waiting period. 
Uh, the tribe gave the state or the federal government 60 days to respond to our letter. And if they don't respond to us in 60 days, we're going to take it to federal court. Um, and then hopefully we get a good, good answer. But also my little nephew here wants to say, and, and I'm going to give him the last word. I, I see Renee making her way up here too, so she'll probably have the last word. And then we're, we're out, unless anybody else has any other questions. Is there a, a war chest or a fund that the tribe has that you, to which people can contribute? What a great question. Global, yes. So when you came in, I see the, the pamphlet that's in front of you. Um, and if you could hold that up and let people see that. If you could grab that, if you look at the bottom of that pamphlet, it says knowback40.org as a website. You go on to that website, that's the tribe's website, and they have a really special button up on the corner. It's called Donate. You know, that, and I'm not kidding. These things aren't easy to... It takes millions and millions of dollars to even try to get into the to the court system. And, and uh, we're a poor tribe, and, 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 uh, but we're doing it, and, and we're going to do it. But um, anybody else? So I just wanted to add like one more thing to what I said before. And it's that for the people who support this, who pass this, who you know are making it happen right now, we got to stop looking at it as just like a group of people, an ethnicity, a race, a religion. We got to start looking at this as people. Because once, once say, oh, okay, well, we're going to take all the Native American people's waters and their sacred places. Well, then who's are you going to take next? Oh, well, let's go to the black neighborhoods and take their homes or something like that. All right, well, then let's go to here and let's go to there. Pretty soon, we're just going to have nothing. And all that money and all the jobs and whatnot that we're making are going to be useless. You have no resources to spend it on slash make, you know, something with it. What are we going to do? We're just going to be left with nothing. And it's all going to be for what? Profit? To be used for what? Absolutely nothing. That's all I have to say. Oh, and Lisa, she's feeling the power. All right, so before I was really nervous, but I just wanted to add that, um, like, it may not seem important, and like we're what we're trying to prove how important it is. But the first time I heard about the Back Forty Mine was like last year, around this time actually. And uh, Miss Don was doing this a tour of the um, like the burial mounds and everything that would be disrupted by the mine. And my auntie, she kind of made me and my sisters go. We're all like, oh, we, oh, we don't know what that is. We don't want to go. And she took all four, me and all three of my sisters, so the four of us, you know, we, she bought us, like, candy and, like, drinks and all that for the ride there. So we're all hyped up on sugar and we're all hyper and messing around in the back seat. We weren't really caring. But um, then these two, a little boy and a little girl, um, when we got there, were there. You know, my auntie kind of pulls aside. She's like, quit acting up, like. Get us on the head a little bit close to shut our mouths and listen because we're there trying to like set an example for those little kids and like we were they were acting better than us and we were just messing around and not really caring so then after that we kind of started um acting right and listening to what miss don had to say and the other tour guides had to say and after that it kind of actually hit me that how important our river is and you know i have a lot of little sisters and brothers a lot and I, um, I went home and I kind of looked at them and I'm like, this is what we're trying to pass on to them. This is the river that they're going to get if we let the killer resources, you know, destroy it. That's what they're going to get, you know. Just looking at my little sisters and brothers every day makes me, makes me have just that much more power to fight for our river. That's it. All right, thank you all so much. Um, I don't think they're in a hurry to leave, so after we close the program, you please join us and carry on the conversation. On behalf of UW Fox Valley, I want to thank our Menominee guests for coming in and enlightening us. The key takeaway is this is about us, we. And it's not about we humans, it's about we beings. One of the many beings that the Creator put here, that we are all here together, the animals, the fish, the two-legged, the two wings, we are together and we should be the ones to decide on how we want the rivers to be treated. 
So thank you for your time. Please take some of the handouts. Feel free to stay by. I'm sure we have a lot more information to share. Thank you. He's with the Menominee Nation. And we have some Menominee royalty as well as some special guests from Menominee with us today. They're here to spread the word about sulfide mining and the dangers of sulfide mining. Peoples of this continent in this region have been mining for thousands of years. So it's not that we are against mining. It's that there are dangers that need to be discussed and need to be brought forth with the way contemporary mining is happening. So on behalf of UW Fox Valley, thank you and welcome.